All right, welcome everyone to the Zojo webinar. I am Paul Lefevre, the Zojo Developer Evangelist. And our topic this time is rapid application development. And before we dive right in, uh, this is primarily gonna be a little bit of a talk about rapid application development and then uh, a demo of Zojo and how it can uh, help work with that. If you have any questions at all while I'm talking, type them into the Q&A window. It should be available in your Zoom software. I will see those questions. I'll answer them when I have a moment as appropriate. And I guess that's it to cover, so let's get started. So what are software challenges today? There's a lot. Making software is not exactly uh, an easy task, and you hear about it all the time, how, how things can be challenging. Uh, and one of the big frustrations is that it takes a long time to deliver software. Uh, companies want to create a product and, you know, they have to wait months and months and months. Many projects that are started end up being late or just fail outright. Uh, if, you, if you do any sort of Google searching, you're going to find lots of statistics on this. This is a common problem and it's a, a source of enormous amounts of money being spent and wasted on, on software projects. But these days, it is 2015 after all, software generally needs to be uh, available a bit quicker. Businesses have to adapt to things uh, more rapidly. Uh, you can't afford to take a super long time, months or years, to get the first version of your software out there or to keep updating it as, as your business needs change. And, and that's a common problem. You'll, you'll see it all the time. People will have a software that they've built you know, years ago that's in place and they, they need something changed on it. And... Uh, you know, the the estimates will come back and, you know, this is going to take months. And, like, we don't have months. It's a big problem. Uh, the same sort of thing, uh, adapting to changes quickly. Um, everything changes in this day and age. And uh, something that you didn't think you needed a month ago all of a sudden is mission critical now. And you have to be able to adapt to that. And like I said, you can't wait months or years to deliver the software. Uh, you have a great idea today. Uh, it's not going to do your company, your business all that much good if that idea isn't delivered in a software form uh, until, you know, 18 months from now. That, that's not terribly helpful. And something you're seeing more and more these days that uh, perhaps was less common uh, in the past is user feedback is essential when the creation of software. In the past, you probably have worked on projects or seen projects where, you know, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, upfront design done on uh, software, a lot of, you know, interviewing of people, writing things down, specifications written, requirements written down. And, and that's all well and good, but it's really hard for people, especially users, to think that abstractly and think of stuff they want that early on in a project. So, uh, it's essential to get their feedback, yes, but it, sometimes the feedback you get isn't the right feedback. So uh, that, that can be a challenge. So rapid application development. Now this term has been around for many, many years. Uh, but it's starting to come a bit back in favor as, uh, as a lot of these things I mentioned are starting to become more and more important. And essentially, it's a better way to make software in, in this time. And the idea is you focus, you have smaller focused projects. You do specific things. You don't try and, you know, tackle the entire kitchen sink, you know, everything in the kitchen sink in your project and, uh, and work months and months or maybe even into years on it. You focus on what absolutely needs to be done and you, and you have smaller projects that way. Uh, the little catchphrase you see a lot nowadays is small is beautiful. So how do you do this? Well, limited upfront design is, is uh, primarily the, the common technique. Rather than spending an enormous amount of time gathering requirements, writing up software specifications, that sort of thing, uh, you essentially, you get the idea of what you want and you kind of jump right in and you make something. And then you iterate over what you've made. So you continue to refine it, you adapt it, you add things to it, you uh, show it to people. Uh, particularly the people that are going to be using it so that they can give you feedback on it. And then you, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. You continue to do this sort of thing. So you throw something together uh, that's based on what you think you need 
you show it to people, you get their feedback, you change it, improve it, and you keep that iterative process going over and over until you end up with something that everybody is happy with. And then you ship regularly. Uh, the idea is you get away from having these giant releases that happen every few years of your software product, and instead you push out updates to the product regularly. And this is a big improvement because customers that are using your software uh, now know that you're listening to them. Uh, things that they've suggested or reported, they now see them showing up in the software frequently. So they're happier about the software. Uh, it allows them to feel as if they're part of its creation. And that makes them happier users. Uh, so they can tolerate things that might not work exactly how they want just yet because they know that you are continuing to do regular iterative updates and you're listening to them. So you'll, you'll likely get around to what they're doing or at least you might understand or they might understand why you haven't yet. So it's a, it's a great way to, to create software that has everyone kind of involved. Everyone that's going to work with the software, that's going to build it, that's going to use it, becomes involved. So how can Zojo help with this sort of development paradigm, if you will? Well, at Zojo, we focus on simplicity. And one of our, our guiding quotes here is from famous computer scientist Alan Kay. He worked at uh, Xerox Park, uh, Apple, Atari, uh, Disney, lots of places, very uh, bright, visionary computer scientist. And uh, he said, simple things should be simple, complex things should be possible. And that's kind of the goal of Zojo. We want to make it simple for you to do stuff that you should be able to do simply, which is, you know, create useful apps that are going to help your business. And difficult things, complex things, should still be doable should you have to do those. But a lot of projects don't necessarily need complex things. So why make everything complex just to deal with certain times when you need something that is complex? Zojo is great for making prototypes to show people. Because it is so fast and easy to throw together an app and a layout and a design and, and make it do a few little things, you can quickly bang out an idea for something. I've used this a lot in the past when I, when I worked at other companies that used other tool sets. Zojo would be kind of in my little toolbox there and if we had a big meeting or something that uh, we were talking about how we might build something, I might go and make it as a Zojo app so I could demo it quicker than using other tool sets like Visual Studio and .NET or something like that. So it can be a great way to make prototypes. And I'll touch on this a little bit before, but because Zojo is so approachable compared to some of the other uh, gigantic development suites like Visual Studio or Xcode or something like that, uh, an average person that may not be a professional software developer can actually use it to do something. So you could end up with one of your analysts on your team, uh, your business analyst or something like that, being able to use Zojo to even throw together a prototype to give maybe the engineering side a better idea of what it is they were thinking. Now, one of Zojo's big claims to fame is its ability to have a lot of app targets. In particular, Zojo can create native iOS apps for iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch, that sort of thing. And these are uh, standard universal binary apps, so they're 64-bit, 32-bit to work on a wide variety of uh, uh, iOS devices, pretty much anything that can run iOS 7, 8, or 9. And these apps, like I said, they're native, so they can, uh, they can be submitted to the App Store. Uh, we have many, many customers who have made apps, iOS apps with Zojo that are in the App Store. They can, of course, be installed on devices for testing, and you can... Uh, quickly, quickly build them uh, locally and just run them in the simulator. Zojo can also make desktop apps for all the major desktop platforms. That is Windows, of course, uh, OS X, and Linux. And we cover a wide variety of Linux operating systems. So if, you're, if your office ends up being mixed and you have some developers that prefer to work on OS X, others that prefer to work on Windows, or you have a bunch of Linux machines that you are using for, you know, maybe the, uh, the non-technical side of staff to lower costs on hardware purchases or something like that. Zojo can target apps and create apps for all of those. 
And in the case of the desktop, it's the same exact source code. Uh, there's literally just a few boxes you check to build uh, a Windows or an OS 10 or a Linux version of your app. In addition, Zojo can create web apps. Uh, these web apps uh, are pretty powerful. They're, they're designed pretty much the same way that you design desktop and iOS apps. We'll look at that when we do a Zojo demo in a bit. And if you use Zojo Web in conjunction with Zojo Cloud, you can get one-click deployment of your web apps. So you can design a web app, and you can just hit one button, and it's deployed to the web, and then anyone can connect to it and use it. Incredibly fast and easy. Uh, you don't have to worry about configuring a server, managing a server, dealing with server security, all that stuff. It's just you don't have to worry about it. And then coming soon, Zojo's going to be able to target Raspberry Pi. Uh, these are cute, tiny little computers. Uh, they call them, they're also called single board computers. Uh, Zojo will actually be able to target any of these little tiny computers that use the ARM v7 uh, CPU series. Uh, but we're primarily uh, focusing on Raspberry Pi. That's what I have here that, I, that I'm using. But it's a tiny little computer, little computer on a board. Uh, not super powerful, but it's so small and uh, power efficient that it can be used with lots of things. Uh, has input outputs. So you can uh, create circuits that connect to it. They're often used for controlling things like home automation. Uh, they can be put in little robot thing. <coughs> Excuse me, little robot things. Uh, media servers are another common use form. So Zojo is often used uh, to create apps of iOS, desktop, and web. Uh, but now Raspberry Pi is coming very soon, and we're really excited about that. Be able to create apps for this fun little uh, thing. And I didn't mention Raspberry Pi, in addition to doing all those other cool things I said, is also incredibly inexpensive. You can buy the Raspberry Pi board for around $30 or so. And then with a case and all the other pieces, it still comes out to way less than 100 bucks. So it's a low cost, useful little, uh, fun little gadget. And of course, uh, we like to say that Zojo is easy to learn. Um, I mean, what is easy to learn? Uh, some things are easy to learn, some things aren't. Zojo is, in addition to being easy to learn, it's just, it's not intimidating. You know, when you open up tools like Visual Studio or Eclipse, if you're working with Java, or, you know, a text editor, if you're working with PHP or Xcode, those can be very over overwhelming. Uh, even for professional software developers, you open those things up the first time and you're like, whoa, holy cow, there's a lot of stuff in here. Where the heck do I start? And if you're not a software developer, you open that up and you're like, all right, I think I should close this, and you back away slowly. Uh, but that's not the case with Zojo. It, it doesn't overwhelm you with a bunch of stuff right off the gate. You can just open it up. You can kind of get a general feel for how things work, how, how everything's laid out, and it allows you to pick it up very quickly. And if you're already a software developer, Picking up Zojo is incredibly easy, incredibly easy. And if you're not, it's also not too bad. And another nice thing about Zojo that uh, I mentioned earlier, it can, it can target apps for lots of platforms, but you can also actually use Zojo on lots of platforms because Zojo itself is written using Zojo. So the development environment can run on Windows, it can run on OS X, and it can run on Linux. So if your developers prefer to work on those particular platforms, they can actually use Zojo on those platforms, but still create apps for people that are on different platforms. So that's pretty neat. Now I'm gonna hit here a few benefits of Zojo and then I think uh, we'll jump into a demo. So uh, we like to say that Zojo has a lower overall cost than a lot of other tools. Now, when I say overall cost, I'm obviously not talking about, you know, the initial price to purchase these things that you go through with the store and you pay with your credit card. Uh, the cost of tools for creating software is a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall cost of a software project. Tiny fraction. Uh, by far, most of your cost is going to go into paying the programmers that are creating the software, uh, the people that are testing it, uh, all that sort of stuff. So overall, I say Zojo has a lower overall cost because it allows you to make your software quicker. And if you make it quicker, that means you're spending less hours of salary to pay for people to make your apps. And that's where the cost really starts to come down. 
You know, if you can make an app in half the time using Zojo versus some other tool, that's a significant cost savings. And of course, Zojo itself is not terribly expensive to begin with if you, when you're just buying it. I mentioned before, uh, the complexity on Zojo is much lower than other tools, making a part of the factor which helps with the, the lower costs is that, you know, there's, there's less stuff to have to weed through to actually create your software in the first place. Of course, Zojo is rapid to development, not only rapid application development, but Zojo is just rapid to use. Uh, you'll see when I go through the demo how quickly it works, how you can quickly move stuff around, how quickly you can run your projects to test them, that sort of thing. Going down to the actual usage of Zojo uh, from a programming standpoint, it is event-based. Uh, this is a simpler programming paradigm for people to kind of grasp their heads around than, than some of the uh, techniques you may have heard about, like model view controller or something like that. And essentially, it just allows you to design your layout and then put your code in events that are related to the items that are on your layout. So if a user clicks a button, you can put code in an event that is called when the user clicks the button. So it's a little simpler way to get started. The Zojo programming language itself is very similar to other programming languages. Uh, it's, if you've used Visual Basic at all, you're going to find yourself very comfortable with Zojo. If you use C Sharp, also incredibly similar. Java, very similar. Uh, it's a bit similar to Swift as well. Probably not as similar to something like C++ or maybe uh, Objective-C but it's very, very familiar. So if you look at it after having, you know, done any programming in the language, you're going to go, okay, yeah, I think, I think I understand what that's doing. Of course, Zojo is object-oriented. It has a, an object-oriented design that, again, is very similar to what is in uh, the .NET languages or Java. So if you're familiar at all with those, you're going to understand the object model that's used in Zojo. And I mentioned this previously, but Zojo itself is, because of these things, it's usable by non-developers. So you don't have to have your uh, bachelor's in computer science or your master's in computer science or be professionally trained in programming or anything like that. Uh, we have lots and lots of people who are technical. They understand stuff, but they would never consider themselves to be programmers or software developers. And they create all kinds of apps using Zojo that help uh, their business and help them uh, or even help them do their job more efficiently. And of course, Zojo is free to try. So at the at our website, you can download Zojo and you can use it and you don't have to pay anything. Uh, you can use it to learn Zojo. You can use it to build apps and run them in debug mode. You can play around with it to your heart's content. Uh, we only ask that you purchase Zojo when you're ready to build your software for distribution to others. All right, so let's jump into Zojo and take a look at some of its stuff. All right, so I have Zojo here running. And I'm just going to lower this window so I can see it here. So you can see right here, when you first start Zojo, there is a project chooser that appears here. And the, the main parts to focus on or are the different project types that are available to you. Of course, there's desktop, there's a web. I didn't mention console earlier, but that is here as well. That is essentially an app that has no user interface. It's just text-based. It runs in the terminal or the command line. And those can be very useful as well. And then, of course, iOS. So I'll just type in uh, an initial application name here for iOS. I click OK, and this opens up the main Zojo workspace. And as you can see, there's not a whole bunch of stuff that's thrown in your face right here. It's just, it's divided into a few areas that are pretty easy to grasp. You've got the main uh, toolbar at the top, not, again, a whole bunch of buttons to overwhelm you. They're nice and big and clearly state what they're for. On the left-hand side, you have the project navigator, and this shows you what's in your project, the, the layouts. Uh, in this case, for an iOS project, that would be the views. So we have here uh, what the initial view that's selected that's empty. Uh, this also contains things like icons and images that you can add for your app. You can add additional code by adding classes to contain all your other code. You can put modules in here. You can add any number of additional views, of course. And you can see up here on the insert button, you know, right here, all of the stuff that you can be added 
to a project. The center area uh, changes depending on the context or what you're doing. So if you clicked on a view, the center area is going to show the layout editor. And this is where you can design how you want your app to look. And it can, of course, contain one single view, multiple views. And we'll, we'll, I'll bring up the uh, examples of web and desktop as well so you can see some of the differences, although they're very, very similar. So you can see that this is what it looks like here. And it gives you kind of a picture of an iPhone so you can kind of get a visual for how it might feel when you actually run it. It has its own toolbar. There's a bit more buttons here for the specific toolbar, but that changes, again, depending on the context. And a lot of these are related to uh, moving the controls and laying out the controls and whatnot. If you were editing code, this center area would change to be uh, a code editor. So it'd just be a big white box where you could type your code in. And there's other editors and things as well, depending on what you click on. So if you click on one of the icons, you can see you get boxes for all the different size icons that Apple requires you have for your apps so that uh, things show up properly on the different uh, devices. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, displaying right now is the library. And this is a list of all the controls that you can use on your layouts. So you can see right here, uh, let me just move another window out of the way. So we can see right here, you know, you get buttons and inputs and, and other things you can drag over. So, you know, I can just click on something, I can drag it onto a layout, I can resize it, I can put something else up here if I want. I can throw up something that's bigger. So you can see, you can just drag stuff on here, you can drag it around or reposition it or whatnot. And also on the right-hand side that is shared with the, the library space, I can click up here to see the inspector. And the inspector shows properties for whatever happens to be currently selected. Now, nice and easy and focused. So right now I have what is called here an HTML viewer that is selected, so you can see its properties. If I click on the text field, you would see it would change to show the text field properties. If I clicked just on the blank area of the, the layout, you see the entire view gets selected, and I see the properties for the view. So you can see how that works. It changes depending on what is currently selected. And for adding code, I mean, generally, I mentioned earlier, it's, it's event-based, and you generally start with that by just double-clicking on things. So I just double-clicked on that button. And you can see it brought up an event handler window here that lets me add the specific event handler I want to I wanted to deal with. So in the case of a button, the action event handler gets called when it's tapped. So I can just select that one. It's automatically selected. I can click OK. And that adds it to the control. And then the process of doing that also displayed the code editor because, well, if you want to add an event handler, odds are you're going to need to put some code in it. So it puts you right here in the code head, the code editor. And the code editor works like, you know, a giant text editor with some special features for writing Zojo code. So I can just type. And you can see as I'm typing here, there's some gray text that's uh, displayed after the cursor. This is the autocomplete. So I can just press tab and it'll fill that in for me. I don't have to type it. So it knew that there was something on that layout that had that name. Because this is all object oriented, it uses dot notation to refer to properties and methods of uh, objects. So I can put a dot here after the, the name of that HTML viewer. And I could just press tab. You can see those ellipses right there. Uh, that indicates there's some more stuff available. So if I press tab, it's gonna show me all the particular uh, things that are available, properties or methods or whatnot. And I know that I want load URL here. I can just type or click on it and it'll fill it in for me. I don't have to type it. And this is a this quick little example is going to end up with it'll show the whatever we type for a URL in that text field is going to display in that HTML viewer. And that's what this very simple line of code does. But just to give you an idea of uh, the code editor and some of its autocomplete stuff, you can see that. So I now have put some code there. And you can see the action events right here. If I needed to go back to it, I can just click on it to view its code. And you know, if I wanted to, I can press return on this to quickly pop up a window that lets me change its caption. That's a kind of a quick access to the most commonly used property for a specific uh, control that's on a layout. I can put in some default text there. And, uh, and, it, 
And when you're ready to test things with Sojo, it's really easy. There's a big run button right there in the toolbar and you can just run things. So I'm just gonna run that there. And you see it comes right up in the iOS simulator. So when I click, or I have to click it because it is a simulator, but if it were on a device, I would tap it. But when I press the button, essentially, uh, you can see the page comes up here in uh, the simulator. And, uh, oops, it looks like I scrolled too far. So there's some uh, baseball games that are happening today. It's the last week of the season, so lots of exciting pennant races. So you can see how quickly it is to just, you know, toss together an app real quick and run it without having to go through a bunch of things that are in your way or a bunch of settings you have to deal with. And there's a lot of these settings that are available and other things you want to do, of course, as you're going through your app to, you know, make it real. Uh, but that stuff's not all in your face confusing you right off the bat. You kind of have it tucked away. So, for example, if you looked at iOS here on the side, you could click on it and you can see the specific settings that are available for making an iOS app. And you can specify your uh, certificates for code signing, for deployments. You can indicate if you want this to create a build that you can then submit to the, to the App Store. Uh, you can change the device that you want to test on, that sort of stuff. All right, before I jump into looking at a for web, I see I got a few uh, questions here, so I'm just going to take a glance at them. All right, so I got a question here. Will Raspberry Pi be available in October? Well, I can't specifically say when Raspberry Pi will be available, but I do have a webinar scheduled in October for demoing uh, some of the Raspberry Pi features. So uh, I'll, I'll let you infer what you want from that as to what that means. All right, Steve is asking a question about when I show the web demo. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And I'm not great at pronunciation of this, but Vyacheslav is asking, can you run this iOS app on Linux or Windows? No, you cannot run iOS apps on Linux or Windows. Uh, iOS apps run in the iOS simulator, of course, and Apple uh, is the only one that makes an iOS simulator, and their iOS simulator only runs on OS X. So there is no way to actually run an iOS app for testing purposes on uh, Linux or Windows at this point. And Kevin is asking, what is Raspberry Pi? Well, uh, at the end, I will uh, direct you to a uh, little overview blog post I wrote about what Raspberry Pi is. And again, uh, I'm doing a webinar next month on that as well. But it's essentially a, a tiny little computer that is, uh, you know, very inexpensive, like 30 or $40 that allows you to do all kinds of fun things. And, you know, I was told how to pronounce this name. Maybe I'll get it right. Uh, Joost is asking about iPad. And yes, absolutely. Zojo's iOS support can create iPad apps as well as um, iPhone apps or iPod Touch apps. Uh, yes, I pronounced it correctly. That's always great. Uh, you can actually have a single iOS project that uh, targets both iPhone and iPad. You can see up here, I don't want to get into too much specifics of the iOS stuff, but you can see I have an iPhone screen setting here that allows me to essentially lay out, not really lay out, but say what the initial screen on an iPhone might look like. And you can see it has by default the view that we worked on selected. You can control some of the orientations. And you can do the same thing on iPad, but you have a bit more control over the view. You can specify whether it's a split view and a split view is something like mail in landscape mode, which has the uh, messages on the left. And when you tap on one, uh, the details show on the right. Or you can have tabs, which are buttons that appear across the bottom of a layout. Uh, that's something like uh, if you ever looked at the clock app on an iPhone on the bottom, it says like world clock and uh, stopwatch or alarms or something like that. Those are tabs. And yeah, so you can do that. And if you, you know, I haven't really change this layout to do anything on an iPad, but if I just switch it here to say uh, run on an iPad, the simulator will start an iPad. It's going to be way too big for this, so let's shrink it. 
And you can see, you know, the app runs on the iPad, but I would have to do a little bit more work to make sure that everything is sized appropriately to take advantage of the space and that and whatnot. But uh, the code itself runs fine on both. All right, so let's close our little iOS example here. And take a look at the next one, uh, which is related here is Kevin is asking if he writes an app for OS 10, does he have to rewrite it for Windows or just simply compile uh, for a different topic? No, you're not jumping the gun, Kevin. That's what I'm getting into next right here. So let's open up a desktop app. So you can see very similar uh, initial start screen. You've got the main layout. In the case of a desktop app, it's called a window. And you know it's just a big blank area. You've got your library here on the side that I can just drag stuff over to, uh, like that. There's a, uh, a menu bar item that's here on the project in the navigator that allows you to edit what the menu looks like. You know, you can add, you can add new stuff here. Oops, switch that over to the inspector, and I can give it a name. Tell it the shortcut key, that sort of thing. And related to what Kevin was asking, uh, here in the navigator part are the, at the bottom are the build settings. And here is where you can just check which targets you want to create builds for. So I can click on each of them to see any specific settings they might have. And I can just check the boxes to build. So if I checked all the boxes, if I then hit the build button here, I would get in my folder here, I'm running on a, a Mac right now, in my build folder on the Mac, I would get an executable for OS 10. I would get an executable for Windows that I could then transfer to a Windows computer and run there. And I'd get an executable for Linux that I could then transfer to a Linux computer and run there. And you use the same source code for this. So uh, the desktop app is going to be the same source code for all the different targets. You can, of course, have code that you want that is specific to a particular platform. And you can just mark that as uh, using some special uh, commands in Zoja that says, OK, this code is only relevant when the app is running on Windows, so only put this code when I'm running on Windows. And, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's the same project file. You don't have to uh, rewrite or anything like that. Uh, Jost is reminding me that some controls may appear differently on some of the platforms, and that is uh, something to remember in the case of Zojo is primarily it's using native controls on the various platforms. So if you've got a button that you uh, ha put on, like I just did here, a button that's on the window, when I run it on OS X, it's going to look like an OS X button. When I run it on Windows, it's going to look like a Windows button. Uh, it's not uh, a generic button that's going to look the same across all platforms. Uh, so sometimes you need to uh, take account for that, but it does allow your apps to look better, more platform native, so users are more comfortable with them. All right, so, uh, you know, like I showed with iOS, you know, you just, you, from the library, you can drag stuff over and create the apps that you need, uh, whatever layouts. Your app can contain as many windows as it needs, of course. Uh, there can be as many things as you want on the window. Of course, you know, like I mentioned earlier when I was talking, simplicity, simplicity. You don't want to overwhelm your designs with uh, bazillion uh, buttons or user interface controls or whatnot. Uh, desktop has lots of things you can add to projects. Of course, classes for your uh, object-oriented designs. You've got interfaces that are related to classes. You've got uh, modules, reports, toolbars, menu bars all kinds of stuff. Code editor works exactly the same on desktop. And I guess not really much else to point differently. I'm just going to press the, the run button here so you can just see that this runs initially without really having to do anything. I've got an app here that, you know, works, is resizable, and, you know, I've got a button that's not going to do anything when I click it because I didn't write any code. But you can see how that operates. All right, uh, let's see. Before I jump into web, I got a question here from Steve that's asking if he has a Windows app that's targeting, looks like Microsoft SQL Server. An iOS version will not allow connection to Microsoft SQL Server. Is there a way to get around that? Absolutely, there's a way to get around that. Um, I did do a couple of web, a two-part webinar, I think it was like in February of this year, 
on how you would do that. And in general, I'll just give highlights of that, but in general, uh, iOS apps do not make direct connections to databases. Uh, that's considered a bad idea on a mobile device. Uh, their internet connection may not be entirely stable. Uh, that's those sort of direct connections probably aren't great for the battery, stuff like that. So the way around that is a, is a new design where you essentially you create a web service that interfaces with your database. And then your iOS app communicates with the web service and asks the web service, hey, I need uh, the data from this table with these values, and then you send it back to the, to the iOS app, and then it displays it. So if you need specifics on how you would create that or how that particular concept works, uh, I'll show you where you can find this stuff. But on our doc site, uh, in our video section, uh, there's a web services area that has these, uh, these two-part webinars that you, can, that you can see. And Vyacha Salav is asking, um, to show real applications. And yes, I have a couple real ones that I'll be opening up and showing you some uh, real code and how stuff looks when it's uh, full blown with some uh, you know, actual stuff that's more useful than me kind of clicking around here. But before I do that, I wanna just show web real quick so you can see what that looks like. Surprise, surprise, it looks almost exactly the same. Big layout area in the, in the middle, this is the web page, but you still are gonna drag your items from the library onto here to create the layout that you want. Code is added the same way. So I can, uh, again, I can drag a button on here. You see the same sort of stuff here. You can see the different things that can be added to a web project. And when I run this, you can see it's immediately gonna launch it into Safari, and you can see what it looks like. And there's a button there. And I can't see the close button. There it is. All right. And then I can switch back to Zojo. When it's running like that, it's in what's called debug mode. So I can step through code, uh, you know, set breakpoints, that sort of stuff. But otherwise, again, it works exactly the same as uh, iOS and desktop from a layout standpoint, from a code writing standpoint. Uh, the language is exactly the same, that sort of stuff. All right, so let's take a look at some actual projects here. Let's close these two down. So included with Zojo uh, is a bunch of projects. We have over, I'm not gonna say over, but it's right around 300 example projects that are included with Zojo. You can see all of them when you open up the project chooser and click on examples here. They're organized, but there's a lot of them in there. Two of the ones I'm gonna focus on here our Zojo Notes and our Eddie's Electronics reference application. So start with Zojo Notes. This is the iOS version of Zojo Notes. And all of these are essentially the same. They're just, a, it's just to-do list. It's a fancy to-do list. So if I run this here, uh, you can see here we have an uh, iOS app. I've created an initial uh, to do, I can tap on it. It th throws another view up on the screen. It lets me edit the details. I've got different things I can click here, change stuff. I can go back. I can click the plus button to add new things. So that's what the app looks like. So you can see here in the navigator the uh, the structure of this particular app, how it's created. And you can see it has two views. There's the list view that shows the initial list of items, and then there's a detail view that uh, lets you edit or add things for the items. And this particular thing, uh, this is a relatively uh, simple initial example, uses a class called note that stores all the notes that are entered. And this class here is just, uh, uh, I wanna open up these properties. So you see as I expand the, the parts of the class, you can see the various things on it. So the, the properties for the class are described right here. I can click on each of them to see their specifics of display the uh, inspector so you can see the types and whatnot. Methods, the same thing here. Uh, go to one of these, it has more code. You can see here an example of some Zojo code. Uh, this particular code is saving uh, the notes into a JSON file on the iOS device so they can be reloaded uh, when the app restarts. And you can see, you know, these are standard things here. There's a dictionary, it's a common uh, uh, data storage object on a variety of programming languages. 
that contains things. And here I'm just looping through all the items that are in our notes array. Each time we add an, uh, a note, we just put it in the array. I loop through the array. I assign it to a dictionary, convert that to JSON, and save it to a file. Straightforward stuff here, but this kind of gives you an initial uh, look at how uh, an iOS app might be uh, laid out. And then for comparison's sake, we also have the desktop and the web versions. And you can see the same thing here. Uh, there's an initial window that contains the list of notes. There's another window that contains the edit. There's still a note class that uh, does the, you know, it's got the same sort of properties and whatnot. And as I expand things, you can see uh, the properties and the methods and whatnot. And, it, and for advanced, you know, if, as you're starting to work on projects, they're going to get bigger. So if it turns out, you know, I can open these up in tabs so that I can have a bunch of things open at once uh, to make it easier to edit stuff rather than having to uh, expand and close things. So then I can kind of just be focused on one particular thing. And you can see, and the code again, it's all very similar. The code between iOS and desktop is not going to be 100% the same uh, because the frameworks themselves are different, but the language is exactly the same. So the DIMMs, the four each's, all that stuff is going to be the same. So you can see, you know, how that particular app could be laid out. And then to compare that, we've also got the web version. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to run the desktop one just so you can see what that looks like. Hopefully, I don't get errors when I run it again. Maybe I've got one sitting in my folder that I need to delete first. Sometimes I have permission problems on my uh, account here that I use for these webinars. So I don't see that that would be a problem. All right, it must have been something locked in that folder. All right, so you can see what it looks like here. I, you know, I can double click on something to show. Uh, I get in my little. Webinar toolbars in my way. There we go. You know, show the details of it, and I can change things, that sort of stuff. And then now switching to the web one. Again, same sort of thing. There's a page here with the notes. There's another page. This one has the addition of a page with a login so that you can have notes for separate users. There's also a dialog for editing the note details. So if I run this here, I can give it a username for a login. And you can see I don't have any initial notes on here, but I can add a note. So you can see how that, how similar they all are to each other. Even from the initial layout standpoint, they all use a note class. So that's how that can work here. I'll, the next uh, app I'm going to show you is, got a, is a bit more involved. We're not going to go into it too much, but uh, I'll have both of these examples packaged up along with the recording of this, so you're able to uh, grab these, take a look at them. Uh, and, of course, if you just download Zojo, both of these are available in Zojo. I'll point you out where they are as well. All right, I got a question here on what web uh, frameworks, CSS, JavaScript, does Zojo use, and is it possible to change them to any other? Zojo uses its own uh, JavaScript framework for communicating with the web app that's running on the server. Uh, it does have what's called a web software development kit included with it that allows you to hook up other UI frameworks like uh, jQuery or something like that for use with Zojo. Uh, there's a few users that have done that if you check out our forums. And there are some examples included with Zojo as well that show you how to hook up uh, other um, UI things built with other libraries so they can be used in Zojo web apps. All right, Kevin is asking, he has several projects in mind that would utilize .NET's tree view control. Does Zojo have an equivalent? Uh, Zojo desktop apps have a control that's called ListBox that can do hierarchical lists, much like a tree view. That's probably the most direct equivalent. There's also several uh, third-party developers that make uh, add-ons to Zojo that have tree views of uh, some kind that work similarly, I imagine. So there's lots of options there for a tree view for use with Zojo. 
And let's see, I got a question here about uh, how does the web app work on the server? What server should I use? Uh, Zojo web apps are deployed as actual apps. So there is an app that you have to run on the server. And you can deploy them two different ways. You can deploy them so that you have, uh, so that they work with the existing web server, usually Apache. Or you can deploy a Zojo web app as what we call standalone, so it doesn't need a web server. You just put the app on a publicly available server. And uh, the Zojo web app essentially has its own mini web server built into it. Either way uh, can work fine. The, uh, the big thing to remember is for deployment purposes, uh, the easiest way to deploy is obviously to use Zojo Cloud. Uh, you buy a Zojo Cloud server from us. You just have this box here checked. So you can see not much to do with settings. And you hit the button on the toolbar that says deploy. Your app is built, copied up to the server, and then run on the public server. And then anyone can use it. Easy peasy. This takes a few moments for it to upload. And you don't have to do anything. If you're deploying things to your own servers, well, obviously, you're going to need to know how to manage the servers. Uh, deploying to Linux with Apache is often easiest, but it depends on the, uh, the web server or whatnot. Uh, Steve is asking if they'll be able to show a web deploy. Uh, well, I could possibly show a web deploy to Zojo Cloud, but I certainly can't show a deploy to any other generic uh, Linux server at this point. I don't know that I even have one available. Um, but when it comes to deploying to your own Linux servers, you're going to want, at a minimum, uh, what's called a VPS. A virtual private server. Uh, for now, you're going to want one that's running a 32-bit version of Linux or a 64-bit version of Linux that has the 32-bit libraries installed. And if you don't know how to do that, uh, we have some steps that are on our doc page, on our doc site. Uh, but if you're not real great at administrating Linux servers, you're probably going to have a bad time trying to administer a Linux server in general, let alone uh, make sure everything is set up for uh, Sojo web apps. And let's see. And if you're using Windows, uh, you can also deploy to uh, Windows servers. The easiest way is to use the standalone option. So if I look here at my settings, you can see the deployment type here is use CGI with an existing web server or standalone. If you go the standalone route, you just build a Zojo web app, you upload it to your server, and then you run it. You can set up your Windows server so it launches it as a Windows service. So it'll start every time the Windows server starts. And that's generally the easiest. A lot of people that use uh, Windows uh, are also wanting to run uh, IIS. Uh, we do have some instructions on our doc site as well for how to uh, set up IIS to work with Zojo uh, web apps that are run as CGI. Uh, but it's not a fully supported uh, configuration, but you, I can refer you to those docs if you've got questions. All right. Well, I'm hoping my audio is still coming through. Uh, Jay is noting that the audio is acting a little funny, so I, I don't see any issues on my end. So I'm going to hope at least that the recording is coming through OK. If people are having audio trouble, please type something in the Q&A so that I am aware of it. All right, well, I'm going to move on then. And oh, now I got someone else saying no audio. Well, I'm going to have to hope that comes back. I don't seem to be anything here on my end that I can do regarding the audio. So hopefully it will come back and it will remain, the audio will remain available for those of you that grab the recording off of YouTube later. All right, so see if I can remember where I was here. Oh, yes, I want to show the next app. So before I do that, I'm going to point you to where these apps, sample projects, are located. So if you go to Zojo and you go to examples, so you can see there's a lot of items in here. But if you go to the sample applications folder, uh, the two that I've been, uh, the first one I showed you here was Zojo Notes. And in here are the desktop and web versions. Uh, next, I'm going to show you Eddie's Electronics. Desktop and web versions are in here. And then all the iOS stuff is in the iOS folder. And there's also Eddie's Electronics in here for iOS and the Zojo Notes that I just showed you in here. 
So all of those are already available in your Zojo download, uh, but I'll also have them packaged up just with this webinar uh, just to make that easy as well. So let's look at Eddie's electronics. Well, we'll start with the iOS one. All right, so we'll run this app so you can see this is using a few more uh, features of iOS. It has tabs. So you can see here at the bottom, I've got some tabs, an info screen. I can click here to see the customers. I can click here, see a report. I can swipe to get through the other quarters. I can click on a particular customer. It switches to their detail information, has an image. I can uh, click on that to see the invoices that they've purchased. If I click map, it'll sh jump into the uh, iOS Maps app and show uh, the address on the map. And I can also click the edit button here to get some fields that would allow me to edit the information and uh, make changes. And I can cancel and go back. And let's click map. You can see what that does here. So that's what this looks like. So what does this look like on a project standpoint? You can see here in the project navigator, there's more items, there's a lot more views. There's the about view and the, uh, the main customer view, invoice view, the sales report view. And you can see on the iPhone screen how this is set up. I have here tabs are set up to say it's using tabs. I can click the edit button to specify uh, the different tabs and what they're called. And then I can uh, move into stuff. If I, as I click on each tab, you can see the specific view that's set up to display. You can set that up however you want, of course. You know, the views are all set up here. You know, you can see this is a giant table that is displaying the information. When a row is clicked, it gets which row is clicked, then it displays the detail window with that information. So you can see how that's all structured. Uh, this particular thing is, uh, Got customer and invoice classes for managing the data, and the data is all handled through a, uh, a database, so it's saved to a SQLite database. Uh, see if I can find where that code is, and I'm not remembering off the top of my head. Oh, that's probably, yeah, this is using the... Uh, the interface for communicating with the classes that are on here. Uh, so you can see there's code here on the classes that handle the SQL commands. This one's updating uh, particular, any changes you've made to an existing piece of data that's in there. So you can see this is a great example app to take a look at when, uh, you know, when you're getting into the more of the meat of things and want to see, you know, how a bunch of different features kind of all come together to make an actual working app. And for comparison's sake, of course, we have versions of this for desktop and web. Same sort of thing, you know, lots of uh, windows as toolbar stuff set up here. We can run this one so you can see what this looks like. It's using the same SQLite database to show the data. This one has the map embedded here because there's more room to work with on a desktop. So you can see we kind of can fit everything on one window. Sales report is a separate window though, but we can fit the entire report on the screen at once. Don't have to swipe through things. I can click and move around stuff. And then while I'm in here, I'll open up the web one. This will run in Safari to look pretty much, uh, it doesn't look like the right app. Yeah, I think I opened the wrong project. Yep, sorry about that, people. Let's uh, open up the right project. All right, we'll run this. This will show up in Safari. It'll look pretty much the same as the desktop app because, uh, you know, this is a Safari version. Uh, running on a desktop has a lot of screen real estate to work with, so it, it can pretty much fit everything the same, embedded map, 
you know, different information is displayed as I click around. Sales report opens up a different page. But otherwise, it looks, it actually works almost exactly the same as the desktop version. All right, well, that's the overview I wanted to give of Zojo itself with a few apps. You know, I showed you how to kind of jump in from scratch and see how the initial layout is. And then we looked at a couple different types of sample apps that we include with Zojo so you can kind of get a feel for how things start to work as you're adding more and more stuff to it. So uh, let's switch back here to Keynote and wrap up. So a few highlights of things I may or may not have had a chance to cover in this webinar. Sojo has full support for databases. So I mentioned that the Eddie's Electronics is using SQLite. Uh, we also have support for Postgres, MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, Oracle Database, and there's also ODB support, ODBC support, so that you can connect to any database that you happen to have an ODBC driver for. Uh, Zojo can communicate with web services. Uh, the last few uh, webinars I've done, uh, maybe one in September, one in uh, August, and probably some earlier in the year, uh, the one that was talking about how to have iOS apps talk to databases also is about web services. Web services are all over the place these days. You, you hardly can throw a, a rock without finding some cool new um, website that has a great web service you can take advantage of. Uh, the last webinar I did uh, was talking about Slack, the very popular Slack messaging services that has a cool web service available that works great with Zojo. So Zojo can communicate with web services, uh, REST or uh, SOAP. Zojo has threading capability, so you can uh, organize your projects to have things happening in the background while UI stays responsive. It has scripting capability, so you can uh, actually make your apps programmable for your power users, uh, which is a pretty neat feature that not a lot of programming tools have, but essentially the Zojo programming language is available for use at runtime in your own apps. Sojo, of course, has uh, full graphic support. You can draw whatever you want to the screen in a variety of ways. I, at our last Sojo conference, I actually demoed how to make some simple retro uh, 80s style games using Zojo. And of course, you can use the graphics for other things. In the case of the 80s electronics example, uh, those little bar graphs of the sales numbers are drawn using the Zojo graphics. And of course, Zojo has some industrial strength features. Uh, Zojo, of course, works with source control. Uh, by default, uh, it's probably going to, I'm pretty sure the default project file is a single project file format. And that's the only format you can use with the free version. But when you purchase a version, uh, you can use the source control format, which saves each item in your project as a separate text file, which works great with Subversion or things like Git. Uh, necessity on, on Teams or even if you're uh, working alone. Uh, there's an open source unit testing framework available for Zojo, so you can uh, have your code unit tested. And there's many, many open source projects available for Zojo as well. Lots of third-party products that are available to add capabilities to Zojo. And we update it regularly. Generally, we shoot for uh, updates every quarter. And I guess we haven't had an update in the third quarter, so you might be expecting an update real soon now. And of course, our dev center is our doc center, which we're gonna take a look at next. So let me just switch back to Safari here and just point out the dev center here. Uh, this is where you can find all kinds of documentation on how to use Zojo. I will point out some areas here that I just mentioned. Uh, the videos section right here has recordings of all the webinars and other videos that we've done. So if you're interested in web services, you can go to the web area and click on web services and watch the two part series on that. Lots of videos in here, I think there's about 70 or so. Uh, there's a getting started section uh, that, you know, if you want to dive in, it can kind of scan this little page here that points you to some initial things that are helpful for people to get started with. Uh, we've got some user guides in here, the full Zojo user guide, uh, iOS guide, uh, and some other uh, pieces of information. This particular section is uh, in the process of being worked on and will continue to be uh, having new material added to it uh, regularly. 
The reference section contains the full reference guide, uh, which covers uh, the Zojo programming language, the Zojo framework, the iOS framework, and then references to our classic framework, which is used uh, with desktop and web apps. And that's pretty much it for the, the main sections. So uh, certainly check out uh, this part of the, uh, or this, this section here, the Dev Center. And if you want printouts, or not printouts, but PDFs, you can come here to the print menu. You can grab uh, pretty much the entire contents of the Dev Center as a PDF. Or if there's a particular page that uh, you, know, you want to uh, get in a uh, printed form, you know, maybe you want to take a look at the Quick Start Guide here, you can just come over here and view this, and then you can say, All right, you know, I'm just going to save this as a PDF and, you know, read that on the plane flight back or something. And our friendly user forum, I have to uh, mention that as well. So uh, before I go here, I just want to point out in my other tab here, the Zojo forum. Unlike other uh, software forums you may have used, this one is... Uh, very friendly. We've got an awesome user community. They love helping people. They answer questions. Um, people here are nice. They're polite. There's no uh, berating of people. If uh, you know you you think you're asking a silly question, no one's going to call you on that. Uh, it's a great forum. Great way to learn and ask questions about Zojo. So I encourage you to uh, you know take a look at this and uh, you know download Zojo, play around with it. If you got questions, you know post something in the getting started thing and ask away. So let's see here. So how can you improve your software using Zojo? Uh, well, you're going to build your apps faster. So you're going to be able to turn things around quicker than you might otherwise using other tools. Uh, it's going to reduce complexity. Uh, Zojo is more focused. It uh, doesn't uh, throw everything at you all at once so that you're overwhelmed and unable to even start your project. Uh, by taking advantage of those two features and iteratively building stuff regularly, you'll be able to improve the quality of your software because you're going to get it out there more and more people will use it and uh, you'll just be able to keep improving it more frequently. And all of these together are just going to lower your overall development costs uh, and everybody likes that. All right, so we've reached the end. Uh, let's see here for time. Well, we've gone over a little. That went longer than I probably expected. And I want to remind everyone that if you have questions, if you're watching this on the recording and you have questions, you weren't able to attend live, by all means, just shoot me an email, paul at zodo.com. Happy to talk with you to see if, uh, you know, you got a project that might make sense to make with Zojo or if you have specific questions on something, ask away. I'm happy to help. All right, I don't see any outstanding questions, which is good. Looks like a lot of people actually have to get back to work, so I'm going to wrap up now. I want to thank everyone for attending. Have a great day.